All right. It's disjoint sets day two. So it's a disjoint sets practice problem. So this is very similar to the problem that we did at the end of lecture on Wednesday. Just draw the final forest after performing these four method calls on this joint, disjoint set. Go ahead, take four minutes to do it. Discuss with those around you. Okay, also, I'm sorry, I realized I forgot to put the Poll Everywhere link on here, so excuse me, I will put the Poll Everywhere link on here real quick. Um, bum, bum, bum. It's the same. It's the same every single day, but I know a lot of you need to QR code it to get there. So there we go. Um, OK, yes, please. Thank you. The projector is now projecting. There we go. OK, great. Let's chat about this. Um, and I think the Poll Everywhere is at least active. I just forgot the link. So uh, remember, a disjoint set is a delightfully complicated object that's really a collection of other objects. So we have the disjoint set 
that I didn't even draw in here. It's sort of like you could imagine a big blob containing all of these individual tree sets. And within the tree sets are a bunch of set nodes. The collection of tree sets are called the forest. So uh, can anyone tell me what happens when I call make set of nine? How does the make set method work within a disjoint set? What's it going to do? Any brave souls? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have no idea. Love it. That's absolutely what an incredible educated guess. Absolutely. That's exactly what happens. It just adds a new set with nine in it. Boom. Love it. And remember, make set, we only can run make set with a single item in it. So very similar to cross goals, which is why we're learning this. We're just going to make a new set with a single vertex. It's a little island unto itself at the very beginning. OK, next, we're going to union 1 and 9. Does anybody want to talk me through what happens here? Sure. Uh, first two binds the representative for 1. Mm -hmm. Love it. So we start here, we bounce, we bounce, we find that the representative of 1 is 2. Yeah. And then we find the representative of 9, which is 9. Which is 9. Perfect. Exactly. So 1, we call find set on each individual item. Find set jumps directly to the set node because we have another magical structure a hash set that lets us jump directly to a node. Then we follow the parent pointers, because remember, these are inverted trees. Or really, I think all of CS, they're kind of inverted trees. Like we draw them with one node branching out. These ones are actually kind of looking like a tree, maybe. I don't know. Um, so we go from the bottom of the tree to the top of the tree. The overall root will always be the representative for that given set. And then, because we want to keep the tree heights as short as possible, we're always going to add the lower weight, i.e. the one with the fewer nodes, set into the larger weight set. It's like the bigger amoeba consumes the smaller one or something. So we will take 9, and we're going to directly point it at the overall root. So we're not going to point it at 1. We're going to point it at 2 because we're trying to keep things as short as possible. Yes? Ah, in this case, wouldn't we prefer to have one pointing directly at two? Because there's no reason, right, for it to point to zero first and then to point to two. This is just some imaginary state, you know, we kind of jumped in at. But I'm going to put a quick pin in your idea, because I promise the last like four slides of this lecture are all about how do we get to that ideal state? So you're absolutely right. The ideal state would be if one pointed directly at two, but we got to figure out how to get there effectively. That's what the back half of this is. Any other questions? Love the foreshadowing. Okay, so we move nine into the set that's represented by two, effectively deleting that fourth tree set because it has been consumed by a different tree set. Then we call union of 0 and 7. Who wants to walk me through what happens here? 0 and 7. It is the same algorithm we just described. So I hope it's not a terrifying thing to do, even though it's weird, maybe to talk in front of other people. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. So which node is going to point to what node? Mm -hmm. And then 7. So we're going to, so 0 is in the set represented by 2. We found that out because we call find set on each item first. So we call find set on 0. We learn it's in the set called 2. We called find set on 7. We learn it's in the set called 7. The set called 2 is bigger than the set called 7. So the bigger set consumes the smaller set. And then, you know, they merge, 
So now we're down to two total sets, tree sets, in the forest. Questions on that? Remember, you will be implementing this for P4. So I'm trying to help you, I promise. Okay. Finally, we call a union of 8 and 5. Can anyone tell me what happens here? It is a repeat of the last two movements. Yes, please. So eight back to two, boom, five boom. Back to six. Boom, boom. Love it. Absolutely. And there we have our final configuration. And this would essentially represent the end of Kruskal's because now all of the vertices are connected in the same set. So this is sort of where the Kruskal's algorithm would end once our forest shrinks to a singular tree set. Yes, please. Ah, yes. So we are going to decide who consumes who by what we're referring to as weight, which is the number of nodes. A different way to evaluate than, say, when we were doing AVLs, when we were thinking of height, which is how tall anything is. This is now number of nodes, not necessarily like number of edges from top to bottom. Yes, good clarification. Any other questions about this? Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so your final programming assignment has officially been released. I think it got went out super late last night. So we're going to give you until Friday, March 8th. Um, that's the last day of the quarter. So it's the last day I can accept stuff. So I might as well give you all the time to do that final assignment. It is significant in effort. Please start early. And in fact, we want to incentivize you starting early, so we added an extra credit assignment. It's called like P4 introductory quiz or something like that. And it's just a bunch of questions that essentially guide you through reading the spec and what is important for you to know so that you can get started. The extra credit introductory assignment will be due a week from today on Friday, the 20 something. Crap, I should have. Thank you. It's on the slide. How helpful, past Casey. Um, so it'll be due Friday the 23rd. We will not accept late assignments for that one. As you can imagine, the point is to give you extra credit for getting started early, and all you have to do is just read the spec and think about it. And I can also, you know, hot tip for you, whenever we put out these multi-week assignments, office hours in the first week get real quiet. And I can promise you that office hours in week 10 are going to be real busy. So now's the time to go to office hours and just sit there and read the spec and ask any questions you may have to the TAs. Promise, it'll make your life easier. Um, also, sorry, this, uh, there is a little bit of incompatibility issues with this assignment and the most recent version of Java. So you just have to change some settings in your IntelliJ when you're working on it, but all of those instructions are in the Ed Post. So just make sure that you read through the Ed Post if you're getting any sort of weirdness. It's just a Java update that surprised us a little bit. Um, any questions about P4? Okay. Then, reminder: the midterm resubmission is due tonight. Um, I think there was a little bit of confusion, very understandable confusion, and um, it sounds like maybe the TAs told people a few different things, so we wanted to pick just one consistent thing. So if you heard or any confusing things or inconsistent things, just so you know, you only have to submit the questions that you want regraded. So if you got full credit on something, you don't have to resubmit it. Now this can cause some issues in some of the design ones where like maybe you got three out of four of those problems totally right, and you just need to resubmit one of them, please try to come up with a solution for the one you're resubmitting that does work with the other ones. You know, these things aren't really in isolation of one another. But you don't have to resubmit the other ones. We can go look at your previous submissions. Um, let's see. 
Yes. After we grade your resubmissions, we will release those grades, and then we will open up regrade requests for both the original midterm and the resubmission at the same time. So resubmission means I know I got something wrong. I'm correcting my answers. I'm giving it back to you. That's what we're working on now. Regrade means I think there has been a mistake in the grading. Please reevaluate this. We'll do all of those regrade evaluations for both the resub and the midterm at the same time. Yes? Yes, if you could do that, that would be fabulous. And also, if I didn't say it clearly enough before, this is a no-risk resub. I will always take the highest score out of whatever you're getting, just so you know. So your score definitely can't go down. Yes? Yes, we will be doing that. Obviously, you can kind of like do some of the math yourself right now if you wanted to, but we will be officially migrating things, so you don't have to do that calculation. Um, it's on my to-do list. Other questions? Any other administrative questions? Cool. OK. Um, all right. Uh, also, I just wanted to help you out a little bit. I noticed that there can be some confusion in P4 because there's a lot of objects in P4, which makes sense. You know, you're building disjoint sets, you're building graphs. And so the way that P4 is laid out is there is a graph object. The graph object stores a collection of the edges. And that's how you know which vertices are connected to which edges. But there is also an edge object, and each individual edge object stores inside of it the weight and the vertices on either end of the edge. So you're going to need to co-mingle using these different objects in order to get all the information that you need. So for example, if we're thinking about Dijkstra's again, remember when we're running um, Dijkstra's, we're going to take in the graph to traverse, and we're going to take in the vertex that's our starting vertex. So this graph object is what we're taking in there. Then we have those two maps that we're filling out as we go along, the edge two or the back pointers map, and then the distance two, which is how we evaluate whether or not we found a shorter way to get to a given vertex. And then we need some collection of vertices to visit. And you're going to start that collection with the start vertex. That's how you enter this while loop while there are unvisited vertices. You got to kind of put something in that collection to even enter the while loop for the first time. And then in the while loop, you add in any unknown vertices that you see that are connected to that given vertex. So it's like for each loop of the while loop, you pull out what's in that collection, you loop over each of the outgoing edges from that given vertex, considering each of those vertices on the other side of an edge. If you find a new distance that is smaller than the old distance, you update the maps. Any questions on that so far? I'm kind of guessing nobody's really looked at the assignment yet, but this is mostly for you at a later time when you really get into it. This is almost identical to the Dijkstra pseudocode that we talked about on Monday, Friday. Um, but I made it even closer to the line-by-line -line solution that you need to implement. Cool. Um, also, I realized that I maybe skipped this definition. So for your exercise five, that's what we're on. Um, I just wanted to clarify this terminology, strongly connected components. Strongly connected is an idea of in a directed graph a subcomponent where you can leave one vertex to another and return to it. So by definition, there's a lot of cycles in this, but I just wanted you to make sure that you had a definition for this one. I think I just skipped it whenever we did that one. Any questions about the graph terminology from your exercise? Yeah. So. I think, there we go, that is a strongly connected component of the graph. Yes. Because in that subsection, you get, can get from every vertex to every other vertex. That's its own component. It's not considered strongly connected. Great, cool. 
Um, okay, any other questions before we dive back into disjoint sets for the day? Okay, um, by the end of this uh, lecture, you'll have everything you need for exercise five and P4, so it should all be good to go from there. Um, okay. So we have been learning about how to implement disjoint sets, and we already know we want to pick the smaller tree to go under the larger tree to keep the tree short, but let's actually talk about how we're going to implement that. So we're going to do this by what we're going to refer to as weight, which is the number of nodes, and we're going to store the number of nodes in the root of any given tree representing that. So Let's say we have a disjoint set at the very beginning of a Kruskal's run like this. We've got four separate tree sets. They're each of weight one. If I union A and B, I'm going to, it doesn't matter, they're both the same size. So in this case, there's like a tie in who becomes the parent of whom, and that's, it doesn't matter. So we're just going to make A become the child of B, and then we're going to take the weight of the two trees that combined, add them together, and store that new weight in the reigning overall root. So A had a weight of 1, B had a weight of 1. When we union them, now B is going to store their combined weight of 2. If I union B and C, C had a weight of 1, B had a weight of 2. We add them together and store them in C. Same thing. D had a weight of 1, B had a weight of 3, so when we union them, we add the weights together and we store that under the overall root. So now what's great too is all of these are directly connected to the overall root, so that's as short a tree as we can get. So the time it takes to get from A to the overall root is constant time, it's just one jump, which is really nice in this context. That's kind of the best case scenario for a find call, right? When we have one parent and everyone else is their immediate child. That's the best case scenario. Let's think about the worst case scenario. So if the best case scenario is the shortest tree possible, then the worst case scenario is that degenerate tree that's like the tallest tree possible. But if we've already added this whole like weighted union optimization where we're adding the smaller tree into the bigger tree, like let's really think about how bad things could get. Aren't we already sort of protecting ourselves from at least the linear um, linked list sort of situation? So the key here is when we have two sets of the same weight, and we union them together, that is always when the height is going to grow. If we have two sets of differing weights or differing heights, taking the smaller one and adding it into the larger one doesn't grow the height. But if the two sets are already the same height, then they're going to have to grow to some degree, just like we did here. If we had two sets of size one, then when we union them together, now we've got you know, some height, whereas previously we had our little, like whatever you want to call it, sapling in the ground or something. What if we had two sets of size two? Again, it doesn't matter because we can't decide based on weight who to union into whom, so we're just going to pick, but now the height has grown, which it had to, right, when we union two things in the same size. Same situation, two things of the same size. Every time we union things of the same size, we are going to grow the height by one, according to how we have currently implemented it. So this is our new worst case scenario. Since it only grows when things are of equal height, we can't get the actual linked list anymore. This would be a lot taller if these were all just singularly linked. Can anyone guess what the height or the runtime, the worst case scenario is of this kind of tree? Yeah. Log n, exactly. So because of that weighted union optimization, that causes the tree to only grow in height when we union sets of the same size, the tallest this tree could ever get is of log n size. 
So taking it back to the Kruskal's uh, pseudocode, what's great about this now is if we're looking at the parts of Kruskal's that a disjoint set does, make set, that's a constant time. We just throw something new into our hash map, throw something new into our list find an union whose runtime is determined by the height of the tree or the number of iterations it takes to go from the bottommost child up to the top parent. That has now been limited from previously a worst case scenario of n to now at least log n. So we're getting a little bit better. But as our friend astutely pointed out at the beginning of lecture, wouldn't it be more convenient if every child pointed to the overall root and, you know, it's sort of like we're going to be traveling these paths so often. And just like in the example in the beginning, when we were initially looking for one, we had to travel past zero up to two. It's like, oh, well, as I travel these paths, I'm kind of like navigating the tree. <clears throat> Pardon me. And wouldn't it be convenient if as I'm navigating the tree, I'm like, oh, these things don't need to be each other's children. Let's just make them all the direct child of the overall root. This is an optimization called path compression. Let's talk about what path compression is. So path compression is a little interesting. It's kind of an optimization type we haven't seen before because what's special about this is we are going to alter the state of the tree in runs of find so that future runs are faster. It doesn't help us in the moment but it helps us in the future. So it's like if we're already going to have to walk this path, we might as well make it easier for the next person to come along. So if we are back at our worst possible case scenario that we just talked through, if I asked you to do a find of 15, what would happen is you would come in, you'd say, OK, here's 15, because remember, we have that map that takes us directly to a node. So we don't have to search for the nodes. That's nice. So we get a constant time, direct jump to 15. But then I've got to jump to 14, and then I've got to jump to 12, and then I've got to jump to 8, until eventually I can find that that is in the set represented by 0. But I had to touch 14, 12, and 8 as I looped up towards my parent. And it doesn't matter the order, right? It just matters that they're all connected. So what if I just changed each of those nodes after I've touched them to now point to the overall root. It means anytime we travel a path in the tree, after we eventually get to the overall root, if we keep track of who we saw along the way, if we keep track of the nodes we touched on the path up to the overall root, then that gives us the opportunity at the very end to update all of those nodes to just point directly to overall root. And the tree is a little bit shorter. It's compressed. The path is compressed. Questions? OK. So what's nice is now every time you call find, every future call of find is faster. And remember, we call find inside of union. So every time we call union, we call find, which makes the, path, the tree shorter. So every time we find our union, we're going to make this more and more efficient, or we're going to move us closer and closer to the best case tree scenario, which is one overall root, and then a bunch of children directly pointing at it. Now, it is the natural time to talk about how this improves the runtime. But like I said, this is a little different, right? Because we are optimizing for future runs. And we haven't really talked about code analysis in that way. We've only ever really talked about code analysis in terms of like what immediately happened, what was the runtime of that. It turns out you can do a bunch of mathematical calculations to analyze what the overall runtime would be across multiple actions. But that's something called amortized analysis. And it essentially involves a bunch of statistics where you average out the runtime of rare events across many common ones. This is actually why I called the hash table thing like having an in-practice runtime, because I didn't want to make you do all the math to show that it's so statistically unlikely to get 
a degenerate hash table that we don't even consider it because the actual amortized analysis of how the hash table behaves and the amortized analysis of how our disjoint sets behave takes into account runs across multiple calls. And I'm just not going to make you do that math. But that's kind of where the in practice came from, because I'm like, ah, there's a lot more things we need to take into account here than just the immediacy of what we're executing. But I am going to, in a very fast, hand wavy fashion, show you what the runtime is for when you do path compression. Um, I don't mean to scare you. You don't have to know this math. OK. Um, so let's say we call m distinctions on fine, meaning we make a call to the find method m times, and we use weighted union and path compression optimizations. The runtime is going to be something called m log star n. Now, log star n is the iterated log. And this is a mathematical idea of the number of times you need to apply log to n to get the value of n to decrease under 1. So if we think about the way that the logarithmic graph grows, you know how it kind of like has a sharp speed at the beginning and then it just sort of levels out? That's because if you keep taking the log and keep taking the log and keep taking the log, the values just got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the differences between the log and the log and the log get smaller and smaller as well. It kind of asymptotically evens out. Well, if you just call log n of log n of log n of log n of log n over and over and over again, you're actually just kind of eventually going to get to something that flattens out. So log star is the idea of some you know, future state of calling log repeatedly that takes you to that asymptotically small value. This is a thing I didn't know. Research told me this, OK? But log star is less than 5 for any realistic input. So it will eventually reduce down, no matter how realistic you know the giant number of n you got is, eventually we can call log on that number enough times, but we reduce or asymptotically get down to the value of 5. I don't know how the research know, researchers know that, but they do. They're magic. Now. What's amazing about that, then, is if we think that eventually this amortized analysis, log n of log n of log n, times m calls, well, eventually the logarithmic aspect of that math turns into the value 5. And that means if the value 5 is a constant, thus independent of n, then technically, Navigating the disjoint set trees in amortized analysis all eventually reduce down to constant time. Because you're just constantly improving that tree. And if you think about it, you eventually get to that point where the tree is just that one parent and all of those nodes. And then from there on afterwards, anytime you call it, that is constant time. So we've amortized possibly the worst case scenario where it was that log n tree till it was eventually the super squat tree. And then we get to live in that fabulous squat tree reality, which is a constant runtime. And because that is so much more the majority of the time, we consider that to be a constant runtime. Kind of like the hash table one, where we're like, yeah, I guess we could get the linear one, but it's like super statistically unlikely. That's kind of what's happening here. So we consider disjoint sets to run in constant time because of amortized analysis. Does anyone have any questions about that? I may be able to answer some of the mathy stuff, but it's just the idea that over time we eventually get closer and closer to constant runtime. Yeah. What is the star? What is the star? Yeah. It's just uh, it's an annotation for this idea of this sort of like asymptotic rate of log. Great question. So what this essentially leaves us with is you're correct. I said this is an amortized constant runtime. But the worst case is still always log of, in this case, v. Because if we think of encrust goals, 
the number of set nodes, the number of things that are going to be anywhere in those set nodes of our disjoint set, that's the number of vertices, right? When we go through and we initialize all of the vertices to be little islands unto their own, that's the value n, which is the number of vertices. So I think there we go. Here is just some runtime calculations. We still do end up with the log v as the worst case scenario. But here's another delightful math thing to think about. For an MST to even exist, there must be more edges than there are vertices. Because remember, an MST must always have v minus 1 edges. That's that fence post thing, right? Like we know there's always going to be one more post than there are chains connecting them. But when we look at the graph, remember it's like we're trying to find a subset of the edges that represent the MST. So for there to be a subset of edges that represent the smallest total weight, that means there's always going to be more edges than vertices. And I will just tell you, practically speaking, it is much more common to have a graph where there are more edges than there are vertices. And so we can actually then assume that the value of E dominates the value of V. And so the overall runtime of Kruskal's ends up being entirely dominated by this runtime up here, E log E, which is the time it takes to sort all of the edges by weight. Come back next week where we're going to talk about sorting. It'll be fun. We love sorting. I'll explain to you where that E log E comes from. Any questions on the runtime here for cross goals then? Cool. Okay. Great. Okay, let's talk about the stuff that's on your exercise and what you're actually going to write in code. So I hope that at this point we feel pretty comfortable with like what's happening under the hood of the disjoint sets. But I'm kind of doing this annoying teacher thing that I did with heaps where I wanted you to understand all the theory, but you can just implement it with an array. You don't actually have to implement it with nodes. So let's talk about how to do that because if we probably know at this point, arrays make everything more efficient. So what if instead of storing these as set nodes with references to other set nodes, we really just stored some value that represents the overall root or the parent for that individual item. And that's exactly what we did with the heaps. Remember, we sort of had indices representing which element was which, and we could use math to jump between those. Here's how it works in this case. Let's say we have a disjoint set like this. There's three sets within this disjoint set. The three overall roots for the set are Joyce, Eileen, and Paul. And we can see we then have some sort of official mapping between Joyce and some index of an array, just like we did in the heaps, right? We had some map that's like, hey, this index represents this value, right? So Joyce is represented by index 0, Eileen is represented by index 2, and Paul is represented by index 4. You have some type of hash map that tells you that. And we are going to put negative 1 in each of those element spaces, indicating that those do not have parents. We're going to use a negative value to indicate that those are overall roots. And then, in everybody else's element, we're going to store the index of their parent. So Sam and Ken are direct children of Joyce. So if we look, Sam and Ken have 0 at their element meaning Joyce is their parent. Alex's parent is Ken. Alex has a 6, and so then we would use this 6 element to jump over to index 6. And that's where we would see Ken has index 0, and then if we wanted to jump all the way, then we would get to Joyce as the overall root. So now the up travel to find the representative is just jumping around indices of an array. Questions about that? We're still maintaining the sort of tree structures in our brain. There's still this idea of parents and children, but instead of traveling across pointers, we're just jumping around within indices of an array that's representative. 
This is super important for P4. This is how you're going to actually implement it. You're not actually going to do the nodes thing. You're going to do it with an array. So let's keep in mind how many objects we have here. One, we have this object. This object tells us what the association is between any individual vertex's value and the index of the array that represents it. Ignore where these arrows are actually pointing. That's just me trying to say this points to the thing. So in this map, that's where you would have Joyce is represented by 0, and Sam is represented by 1, and Eileen is represented by 2, and Alex is represented by 3. So we've got a hash map that maintains that. Then we've got this structure. We've got this array that's storing in the elements the index of that given item's parent. So let's say this is my new find. First, I'm going to jump to the index of the array where the thing I'm trying to find is. So if I'm trying to find Alex, I jump into my hash map and my hash map says, hey, Alex is represented by index 3. So I jump to the array at index 3. And then I see what's stored there. And I see what's stored at index 3 is 6. So now, it's time for me to loop until I get to a negative element. I'm just looping through the array, which is representing me starting at the bottom of a tree and following parent pointers. So Alex stores a 6. That's not a negative number. So I jump to index 6. And I see that's you know, Ken's representative box. But Ken stores 0. That's also not a negative number. So now i got to jump all the way over here to index 0. And that's where I finally see that Joyce is a negative number. Thus, Joyce is the overall root. But what's great about this, too, is now to implement path compression, all I need to remember is which indices of the array I touched as I was doing that jump. So I touched index 3, and I touched index 6, and then I eventually landed at index 0. So I just need to keep track of which indices I ended up at, and then replace all of them with whatever index was the final overall root. So that's how I would go back in and replace Alex's, you know, it was previously 6. I'm just going to update Alex's element to be 0. And that has essentially compressed the tree so that Alex's immediate parent is now Joyce. Is the silence because I've lost you or it's so clear? The confused faces make me feel it was the first one. <laughs> and that is OK. This might be something that you got to do when you write it out or do in a uh, section. Yes? So if you create like a temporary hash map, you can So you, this is a hash map here that you're going to maintain for each vertex telling you which element of the array it represents. So that is a separate structure. You will have to implement a hash map to store the association between the vertex value and which index of the array it represents. Just like you had to do with the heaps, right? Cool. And then you have a separate structure, the array, that actually stores what is representing those previous trees. Cool. Okay. So when I then apply union, the thing that I was showing you before is a great, great way to figure out finds. But remember at the very beginning of lecture, I was like, oh, well, let's make the overall root store the weight so that we can compare the two weights to know which one's the bigger tree to consume the smaller tree. Well, what if instead of just storing negative 1 to indicate that this is an overall root, that actually stored negative 1 times the weight of that tree that that parent was representing. So Joyce is the overall root here of a weight of 4, so we store negative 4 at Joyce's element. Eileen has a weight of 2, so we store negative 2 at Eileen's index. Paul has a weight of 1, so we store negative 1 at Paul's index. So what happens then is we call find, we get back the two numbers, we negative 1 times to figure out which weight is greater, and then we update all of the parents, and we update the weight stored in the element. So we're not updating any pointers or fields in a node. We're just updating elements in the array. So 
There we go. So if we are going to union Ken and Santino, well, Ken, we've got our magical map that will tell us this is the index representing Ken. And we see Ken's parent is 0, so we're going to make one jump and we're going to get to Joyce. And we see Joyce is a negative 4. Then we call find on Santino. We're going to use our map to come in here and we see Santino is element uh, or index 5. It stores a 2. We jump to index 2 and we see Eileen stores a negative 2. Then we're like, OK, negative 2 or negative 4, who consumes who? We realize that Joyce should consume Eileen. So what we're going to do is we update Eileen to instead of have negative 2, point directly at Joyce. And then we add in the weight that we just consumed to Joyce's element. And if we were smart about it, we would also have updated Santino's um, 2 to be 0, so that it would be an immediate parent as well. You do it now. Let's see how you guys actually feel about it. Go ahead. Take three minutes. Fill in this array representing this disjoint set. You're not making any changes. Just look at the state of this disjoint set and translate it into this array. I'm pretty sure this is the question from your exercise. We'll check back in in like three minutes. All right, let's talk about it real quick. So I gave you int values. The int values are directly represented by themselves in the indices. So index 0 represents this node with value 0 in it. It has a weight of 1. What number am I going to put in this box under 0? Anyone? Yeah, please. Negative 1? Absolutely. OK, then we're going to jump over here. 1 is represented by this index. What number am I going to put in this element right here under 1? Negative 10, absolutely. And then we're going to go to 2. What am I going to put in 2? It's not an overall root, so I want to put its parent there. What am I going to put in this box under 2? 1, exactly. What am I going to put in 6's box? 1. Then we can kind of keep moving, right? We'd be like, 3. What do we put in 3's box? 2. And we also put it in 4 and 5's box, and so on and so forth. 
questions? Yes, please. Yeah, you're right. Uh, ignore the minus one there. I disagree with that because that's not what these numbers are, right? I can math. Thank you. I think there are ways where you kind of like ignore yourself in the weight, but I don't think I did that in the rest of the slides, so ignore that. Any other questions? Great. That's it. That's the graphs unit, y'all. You made it. Congratulations. I know you have some more graph problems to do on exercise five. That'll be due, I think, on Tuesday next week. Have a fabulous long weekend. Don't come to class on Monday. I won't be here. But come back Wednesday, because we're going to do sorting, the engineer's favorite.